Topic video 3A, assembly language, an introduction to assembly language. So what effectively is programming? Well, programming is a group of tasks that instruct a microprocessor to perform a specific function or action. So it is a recipe, so to speak, like when you make a cake, you follow a strict recipe and to ensure that the cake that you make in the end is what you expect, that it's something edible. So the same thing as a program. A program is a set of instructions that a processor must follow in order to achieve a particular application or function. So each one of the instructions enables the processor to function in a particular manner. So each of the instructions is decoded by the instruction decoder and enables a certain logical block on the processor to perform that particular action. So uh, basically it's the program that sets a microprocessor apart from, uh, say, a similar microprocessor but in a completely different application. It's the code that you run on it. So, for example, you can put a microprocessor in, say, a kid's toy like the Furby. You can have exactly the same microprocessor as the, the main brain behind, I guess, a oil refinery that's controlling all the different pumps and actuators and stuff. They're exactly the same processors. But what makes them suitable for those two different applications is, of course, the code that runs on those processes. So it is the code that sets those two microprocessors apart. Even though they're exactly the same, it's the code that basically makes them suitable for that particular application. So almost all microprocessor commands consist of two portions, as we've seen previously. We have the opcode, or the instruction, and the operand, which, of course, is the data. So the opcode, of course, tells the microprocessor the function or the action that it should perform. And the operand, of course, contains the data that is required to successfully perform that action. <laughs> Machine code is, is, of course, the lowest possible level that you can have inside a computer. It, it is the, the lowest possible level language that you have. It is raw binary data that sits inside the memory and it is directly interpreted by the instruction decoder of the microprocessor. So you can't get any lower than machine code level. And basically it's called machine code because it is the language that the machine or the microprocessor itself directly understands. So when you're normally viewing machine code because it's really difficult to look at it in binary format how it's stored in memory, we tend to group them up in 8-bit chunks and view them in a hexadecimal format so usually in two hexadecimal digits we can see any 8-bit memory location and therefore use those hexadecimal values to then work out exactly what sort of instruction is taking place. The opcodes of course are different for each microprocessor okay because they have different instruction decoders. If every microprocessor had exactly the same instruction decoder then they'd be exactly the same microprocessors. So it is as I said previously it is the instruction set effectively that, def that def differs or basically sets each microprocessor apart so therefore we will have different instruction sets for each different microprocessor. So if they're all the same they'd be the same processor and therefore there'd be no benefit in using one microprocessor over another apart from I guess maybe um, maybe the cost difference but effectively each instruction decoder is different because each microprocessor is different. All higher level programs such as your C and your, your, your Delphi and so forth are all compiled down into machine code prior to being interpreted by the microprocessor. So the whole process of either compiling or assembling your code takes your high level source code, whether it's C code or, or, or Pascal or whatever, and simply compiles it down to machine level into machine code. And therefore when you run your, code, run your program, it is actually running in a machine code format that the microprocessor can directly understand. Of course, the next language that's directly above machine code is, of course, our assembly language. And, of course, assembly language can be directly translated into machine code. Assembly language programs are made up of a series of instructions and parameters, as I said before, commonly referred to as opcodes and operands, respectively. Opcodes usually consist of mnemonics or assembler directives. 
And the mnemonics are very easy to remember because they have a very um, they have a very easy to remember name. So the, the name themselves, even though it's only a few letters in size, can directly translate into what action it's actually performing. So th that's the beauty of the Freescale processes is the mnemonics are very logical in the way that they're actually named. So the mnemonics can be manually translated into machine code because it's a direct one-to-one -one mapping if you wanted to do it yourself. But we can also use a program that performs that translation for us. And this program is referred to as a, an assembler. There are, of course, a variety of different assemblers available for each possible processor that's out there on the market. Okay, some are better than others, of course, so it depends on what, what sort of assembly code that you want to be able to write to which sort of assembler that you choose. So you want an assembler that can effectively you know, support your coding style. So if you want to use macros, then you need to get an assembler that provides macro support. So the whole purpose of the assembler is to take your assembly code, your source code, and produce machine code or object code that the processor can directly execute or run. The Freescale assembler program is effectively a key part in our Code Warrior integrated development environment that we'll be using. Code Warrior has the following key advantages. It has an advanced project manager, so it can keep track of all your files and ensure they're all up to date for you and keep them in a logical format so you don't have to go hunting around for the files that you're working on. It has an optimizing C and C++ compiler, as well as a very um, complex assembler. So it has a really good assembler which provides numerous features. It's a very good assembler, has macro support and so forth. We have support for many Freescale processors. We have the support for the HC12 or the HCX family, so the HC11, HC12, HC8, HC5 family. Um, and we also have support for the HS12 and, of course, the Xgate processor. So we have support for both our processors that we actually use on our platform. So support for both the Xgate, Copro, and the main CPU12 core as well. We have a built-in macro compiler, so we can do macros which is a good way of reducing our code size, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. We also have a library maker, so we can make functions that we can reuse over and over and over again, so we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time that we write a piece of assembly code. We have a syntax highlighting editor, so everything's highlighted for you. You can see very clearly what is a label and what isn't. And of course, we have a full chip simulator and debugger, and we have data visualization tools as well, so we have a lot of debugging capabilities at our fingertips with this IDE. Okay, so when it comes to writing a assembly program, an assembly program is basically a, a you can think of it similar to it like an Excel spreadsheet where you have a column in an Excel spreadsheet that has a particular meaning. Well, an assembly program is very much column-based. Every single column in an assembly language program has a distinct and clear purpose. So the first column in an assembly um, language program is, of course, our label column. The next column next to it, which is either space or tab separated, is our opcode column. And then next to that, we have our operand column. And the final column is, of course, our comment, co comment column. So each one of these columns is tab or space separated. And it's easy to tab separate it because then it's very clear when you look at it on the screen exactly which column is what. So I've given an example down here where we, in the first column, we have main, which is our label. We then have a, an instruction or an opcode called LDAA. Then we have its operand in the, in the third column. And then after that, we have a comment to tell exactly what that instruction is doing. Okay, when it comes to the label column, a label must consist of no more than 16 characters in length label must be placed in the first column and one of the very important things about the label is that it must be in the first column the first column starts on the first character of each line so the label must be smack up against the margin if there is space in front of that label then the assembler will assume that it's in fact in the second column so it must start at the first character of a line this is where the label must start okay it must begin with a letter or an underscore 
it may contain any other letter following that or any other character following that so it may contain um, uppercase or lowercase letters may contain numbers may contain a dollar but that is after the initial underscore or initial letter so it's very similar to the naming convention that we use for identifiers in C so the way that you name your variables or your functions in C is the same way that we must define our labels in assembler any label that's longer than 16 characters will of course be truncated to 16 characters so you've got to be very careful how you name your labels okay the next column along so tab or a space next to the label column is your opcode column so the opcode column must contain a mnemonic an assembler directive or a macro name mnemonics of course are the name that we give to the processors instructions and they're they're like only four or five letters in length but they're very descriptive in what they actually do we'll get more on that in s subsequent topics so of course in the Freescale assembler, there exist many useful assembler directives that we can use to define constants, reserve memory locations, and specify specific memory locations for code and data and things like that. So there are a lot of assembly directives that we can use to make our coding a little bit, a little bit easier. They don't directly get interpreted by the assembler, but they guide the assembler in how it should actually develop your code. So one of the really useful assembler directives is of course this DC opcode so you give it a label in the first column you put DC in the opcode column and then in the operand column you put the values that you want to assign to that particular label the beauty of the DC command is the fact that it will create constant strings for you so instead of having to simply put each you know, like if you want to write a string out to the screen, instead of going write A, write B, write C, write D, write whatever, you can simply define a constant string and then you can use, I guess, a looping-like structure to simply go through that string. So you can actually declare strings inside memory. So with the DC string, sorry, the DC opcode, I'll give a few examples here. So depending on the size of each one of those elements, you can specify the size after the DC. So if you want to specify a single byte, you can go give it a label of byte or whatever the label you want to give it. DC, so it defaults to the size of a byte, and then you specify the value that you want to give that particular label. Okay, if you want to do a string, then you can go string dc.b, and the dot b defines that each element of this constant that we're defining is in fact a byte sized element. So therefore we go dc.b, and then we specify the string in inverted commas go hello world therefore each one of those characters will actually be translated to an 8-bit equivalent value so it will actually when you assemble it, it will convert the capital H into its equivalent ASCII value the E into its equivalent ASCII value and so forth so you'll end up with the mem in memory the consecutive memory locations with those particular values for those ASCII characters if you want to define say 16-bit values then of course you can you know give it a label like values use dc.w to say that each one of those elements is in fact word in size and then specify what the words are so one two three four um, seven a five four are the two words that we want to specify at that location so values will in fact point to the memory location of where one two three four is and of course seven a five four will be in memory memory location values plus two because they're 16 bit so it'll be two bytes for the first value and then two bytes for the second value so the Second value will in fact be two bytes after where the value sort of label points to in memory. Okay, another sort of similar command that we can use is DCB, in which we can specify the size. So we can specify it either be byte, word, or long. Okay, and we can also specify the length that we want a particular chunk of memory to be. Okay, and then we can specify a fill value. So we can just say, I want to do a dc.b, so somewhere in my constant region I want to define, say, 100 bytes, and I want them all to be initialized to, say, 0. So therefore we can do a dcb, dcb.b, length 100, and comma 0, and therefore it will 0 all those 100 bytes. So I'll give an example here, data dcb10, therefore it's simply, 
I guess, allocated 10 bytes that um, we're going to use later on down the track. And we haven't pre-filled them with any values, so the, va the pre-fill value is actually an option. Okay, a very similar command is a DS command, which does the same thing. It's used for allocating space. And generally we use a DS command when we're talking to RAM, which is our data space on our processor. So we can basically specify it yet again, the size of it, whether we want to allocate bytes, words, or longs. And of course, if we um, specify the length, the number of bytes, or the number of words, or the number of longs that we want to actually alloc, so we can Using this example here, I haven't given it a label. I've simply gone dc.b10, which means I've now allocated 10 bytes somewhere. So if I needed a buffer to use inside my program, I'd simply you know, give it a name like, say, buffer inside my RAM section. So in the RAM section of my program, I'd go buffer dc, sorry, ds.b10, and then it would allocate 10 bytes that I could then use as a buffer during my program. Okay, the equate expression is a very commonly used expression inside assembly code. This expression allows us to make our code a lot more readable. So instead of having magic numbers littered throughout our code, we can use a series of equates to map these magic numbers to particular labels. So therefore we can use the labels inside our code, and therefore instead of seeing magic numbers littered everywhere, we actually see descriptive labels that make our code a lot more easier to read. So for example, we, when we use it, we give a label, we use the equate in the opcode column, and then the expression is a value that we want to be equated to that particular label. So it's very similar to a hash define that we might use in C. So of course the label is simply the, the expression that we want to, or the, the, basically the name that we want to assign that expression to. Expression spe specifies an expression assigned to that particular label. So simply whatever is on the right-hand side of EQU gets assigned to whatever's on the left-hand side of EQU. And then basically, when you assemble your code, the assembler will simply go through and do a string replacement, so whatever's on the right-hand side will take place of the label that's on the left-hand side, anywhere where it appears inside your code, so it simply does a, a, a string replacement. So for example, I've got an, a, an example here where I've got port A, which is our port A general purpose input-output data register, I've gone port A equate 000. So the memory location where port A actually lives is 000. And I've equated it to the name port A. So therefore inside my code, I can use port A all over the place and not 000. And therefore it's very clear when you read the code that I'm referring to port A and not some other magic 000 number. So it makes your code a hell of a lot easier to read if you use a lot of equates. The set opcode isn't very commonly used. The set opcode is a bit like an equate, but you can reset it throughout the code. So you can do a set and have a particular label set to a particular expression at the top of your assembly code, and then like say halfway down, you can reset that particular label to another expression, and then it'll be used at that value for the remainder of that assembly code. So it's not really commonly used, because generally you just use two different equates. That way it's very clear what they mean, but I guess there may be situations where you want to be able to change that label halfway through the actual assembly code. So I've given an example here, value set to 10, and then somewhere else in the code I've gone value set to 12. So therefore, everywhere up to that second set, value would have the value of 10, and then when it gets to the second set, it will then have the value of 12. So it's simply a means of changing that value um, midway through the assembly program. Okay, the org expression is a very um, important assembler directive. It effectively is, is, is a means of telling the assembler where we want to stick our various portions of our assembly program. So using the org opcode, we can actually define that every little bit of code that follows this org expression will be put in that particular memory location. So the common uses of org is when you might want to define your RAM portions of, of, of your, say, your variables and stuff that you're using. So you might have an org RAM start somewhere inside your assembly code. And then after org RAM start, you'd have all your variables defined. And then somewhere else you have org 
um, ROM start or flash start, and therefore after that you'd have your code. So therefore you could define your read-write portion of your code, where your variables live, and then also define the read-only or the actual constant or the um, actual program portion of your code and, and the chunk that you actually want to be stuck into flash as opposed to be put into RAM. So the org expression is a way of actually saying where you want the various portions of your code to go inside your memory map. Okay, so the, the third column, the operand column, can be quite a complex com column to understand. This is by far the most difficult column. I mean, the first column is, is the label column. You can pretty much pick whatever names you want as long as you follow those few simple rules. Second column is the instruction or the assembler directive column. So it's simply looking that up in the you know mnemonic sheet or simply looking at the assembler directives, you can work out what you need to stick there. But when it comes to the op operand column, you've got to be a little bit careful. You need to be limited. It's the instruction effectively that defines what sort of operand style you can use. And of course, the sort of operand style you need to use also depend on what you want to do with that particular instruction or where you need to get the actual data from, whether it's you know um, immediately following or whether it has to come out of memory or, or, or whether we've got to do some sort of calculation to get it out of memory. It basically is the operand column that, that defines how we're going to get that data. So when it comes to the operand, okay, so the operand um, effectively has to be described in a way suitable for the opcode. So the opcode will define what sort of addressing or operand styles that it actually allows. Operand may consist of a symbol, so it may consist of a label, so a variable name. It may consist of an actual number to a particular memory location, like it may consist of an expression. Okay, And basically all these operands will be interpreted some way by the assembler. And of course the way that you define your operand effectively defines the addressing mode that you're going to be using. So when it comes to the operand format, if you don't specify an operand for a particular instruction, then the assembler will assume that that instruction is inherent, which means it has no data, no operands. Okay. If in fact that instruction does have an operand, it will give you an assembler error. It will say, hey, you're missing something after this. So you'll get a lot of errors if you don't follow the operand style properly. If you have put an expression, like a value or a number, after the particular um, instruction, then of course it, it can either be direct or extended depending on what sort of number that you've put there. And it can also be relative depending on the instruction. If you put a hash in front of that expression, this is very important, if you put a hash in front of the expression, then of course it's considered to be an immediate addressing mode, which means you want that actual value that follows the hash to be the data for that particular instruction. If you've got an, an expression of some kind and a comma and then some register, whether it's X, Y, PC or stack pointer, then of course it's considered to be an in indexed sort of addressing mechanism. And of course, if you've got um, using a bit set or a bit clear sort of operator, then of course you can have expressions, quite a long sort of um, operand. You can have you know three or four expressions, comma separated inside your operand column. So it depends really depends on what sort of instruction you're using and how you want to use it to define what sort of operand style that you use. But we'll talk more about addressing modes in a few slides time. So when it comes to specifying that operand value, there are many different ways that we can do that. We can define it in many numerical formats, depending on which numerical format is easier for your specific application. There's no need going to convert from one format to another. If you've got the number in a particular format, like say you want to display a character, then simply display it as a character. Okay, if you're comparing against a character value or something, then simply compare it against a character value. Don't go worry about converting it to hex or binary or whatever. Just use it in the format that is easiest. So we can represent our operands in many different styles. We can represent them as numbers, in decimal, number in hexadecimal, number in octal, a number in binary, or we can also specify a character as a, as a ASCII character. So when it comes to doing decimal constants, effectively when you use a decimal constant you put no prefix in front of it. It's just simply the number. So 
if it doesn't have a prefix, it's considered to be decimal. So if you put a, a number there with no prefix and you start using you know, any of the letters A to F to say it's hexadecimal, you'll get an error. So if there's no prefix in front of it, then it's considered to be decimal. So in this example here, I've got LDAA hash 28, so therefore that's the actual decimal value of 28, will be loaded into accumulator A. When it comes to defining hexadecimal constants, then we put a prefix of a dollar sign. So the dollar sign defines that number to be hexadecimal in format. So in this example here, I've got LDAA hash dollar 1C, which 1C in hexadecimal is actually 28 decimal. So therefore the value of 28 will go into accumulator A. So I've effectively in this instruction here, I've got the operand in the style of hexadecimal number because maybe that was easier, maybe that's the number I was given in, on the data sheet or whatever, but I've used it in the format that's simpler for me. If I wanted to find an octal constant, then I start using the prefix of the at symbol. So the at symbol is in fact the prefix for an octal number. So octal is a base 8 numbering system as we remember, and so therefore we can only use the digits between 0 and 7, so therefore in the example I've given here, it's using 28 again, the decimal 28, but here I've got an octal format, so I've got at 34, which is 28 decimal. So therefore the value of 28 goes into accumulator A. <coughs> when it comes to using binary constants, so there may be an application where binary is simpler, a simpler means, say if you've got to do, say, I guess, bit settings or bit clearings on a particular register and you need to generate a mask that turns on a particular bit, instead of working out what the bit patterns are and then converting it to hexadecimal, it's probably just easy to use it in a binary format. So when it comes to using binary, we simply use the prefix of the percentage sign. So with the percentage sign, we simply put the ones and the zeros that represent the binary number. Okay, so <clears throat> if you want to represent an eight bit number, then you've got to have eight zeros and ones, or a 16 bit, then you should do 16 zeros or ones. But effectively, if you don't get the right number of bits when you define the binary number, it will zero pad the front of it. Okay, so you may in fact be offset by one if you don't in fact put the right number of bits. So that's the difficult thing when you're doing binary numbers, is you've really got to count to make sure you've got the right number of digits, otherwise it'll offset the front, which can give you some undesired um, results. So I've got an example here of a bit set where, is a, where it is actually a good use of using a binary mask. So I've got bit set DDRA, and then I've defined the binary number to do that bit set. So there's an example of where you might use a binary number in an assembly code. Okay, when it comes to doing ASCII constants, and this is very useful in situations where you might be interpreting keys from the keyboard. So you might be getting the microprocessor to talk to the computer, you're punching keys on the keyboard computer of the computer, and those ASCII characters coming through to your program, and you've got to say see whether it's an A or a B or the letter Q or whatever it's probably easier just to simply leave them as, as ASCII characters. So putting them between single quotes will define it to be an ASCII character. So I'll give an example here of a compare A, where we might be comparing the contents of accumulator A with the actual ASCII character of B. Okay, so in this situation, it's a lot more simpler to simply go to the ASCII character instead of looking up in the ASCII table to see exactly what the ASCII value is for the character B. Okay, the last option that we've got for the um, operating column is we can put an expression in there. Okay, and these expressions are a combination of symbols separated by operators. So an expression recognized by, by the assemblers are in fact plus, minus, multiply, um, divide, shift left, shift right, bitwise and, bitwise or, and bitwise XOR. The very important thing to remember about these expressions is they are in fact evaluated at assemble time, not run time. So you can't simply have variables in there because what happens is when you assemble this, the assembler will actually evaluate that expression and then simply put that result of that expression in a particular location represented by that um, label that you've got. So generally they're used inside next to EQ, EQUs. So that way you don't have to constantly try and work out values. Every time you might change a parameter, you can have the assembler do the calculations for you. Okay, but they don't change. So once you assemble it, they're constant. You can't use it to do a multiply inside your code simply by doing an expression. It's evaluated at assemble time, so that's very, very important. So the example here is I've given 
a value label, label called value. I've got equate it to one plus two times four bit shift bit shifted by two. So therefore the value is then evaluated to three at assembly time. So so it's one plus two is three times four, which is twelve, and then I do a divide by four, which is the shift shift um right by two. So that's divide by four, which gives me the value of three. So therefore value would be equated to the value of three at assembly time. So therefore anywhere inside my code where I had the label value, it would be substituted with three. Okay, but it wouldn't change during runtime. It'd be hard coded and it'd be fixed. So therefore if I want to change that value, I'd have to reassemble it and then it would be changed for that time that it's running. So you can't use this to actually do addition, subtraction and multiplication in runtime, but you can do it to use it to calculate those values for you as you're assembling it. Of course, the last column that we have in our assembly code which is an optional column, is of course our comment column. And I greatly recommend you using this column to enhance the readability of your assembly code. So with a comment, comment always starts with a semicolon, and then we can have any number of characters we want after that semicolon, and the comment is in fact terminated by the carriage return on the end of that line. So in this example here, we're given a full line of assembly code. So we've got example, which is the label. We've then tab. So you don't actually write tab, but it's to there to signify that we've pushed a tab key to tab separate it. Then we've got the opcode or the instruction, LDAA. We've then done another tab to separate it. And then we've got the operand or the data, which in this case is an immediate piece of data, 41. And then we've got tab again to separate it. And then we've gone semicolon. And then we've got our comment, which is A, it's a value of 41. So that is what a line of assembly code looks like. So your program effectively will consist of numerous lines of this exact format. So having nutted out the basic style of an assembly program, one of the key things that you really need to come to grips with is of course addressing modes because that is the most complex column out of that assembly program is of course the the operand column. So how you define that operand will effectively define your addressing mode. So you need to be very clear on how these addressing modes actually work. So with our 9S12 or our CPU 12 core, we have six major addressing modes. And these are inherent, immediate, direct, extended, relative, and indexed. So I'm gonna go through each one of those addressing modes to give you an example of how they work and what their limitations are. So the addressing mode effectively defines what the processor must do in order to get the operand for the current instruction. So it defines how it needs to get that data. So it may define, hey, there is no data, or it may define, hey, the data is right here, or hey, you need to go get the data from the memory. So it will define where, what the processor must do in order to get the data to successfully implement that particular operation. So each instruction only supports a limited number of these addressing modes, and you can look up in the in, um, mnemonic sheet, and it will show you exactly what addressing modes are supported by any particular instruction. So the first addressing mode, which of course is the most simplest, is inherent addressing. In this situation, we have no operands, okay, so therefore there's no data for the instruction. The instruction already has everything that it needs inside the processor core. So for example, with an increment X, it already has the value that it's incrementing already sitting in the register X. So the, it knows what it needs to do, it knows what it needs to do it on, and it doesn't require any additional data to be able to successfully do that because for increment X, it already has a value in X register, and it's simply incrementing whatever that value is by one. Okay, so it already has all the data it requires, doesn't require anything else. That's why it's inherent. With the push Y, or with all the stack operations, the push and the pop, or pull, we have all the information we require. We have, you know, we have the value in the register Y that we need to push onto the stack. We have the value on the stack that we need to say pull back into register Y. So the inherent re instructions effectively don't require any more data because they already have it um, at their disposal. They already have everything they need to be able to successfully achieve that particular operation. Okay, the next addressing mode is in fact immediate addressing and what this addressing mode defines is that the actual data that we require for that particular instruction 
is immediately following the instruction itself. So for example, if I've got an LDAA hash dollar forty one, so the hash defines it as immediate. And if you look in the memory, in this picture down the bottom here, you've got the 40F1 down to 40F5. This is like a memory of where our code sits inside our, our, our flash or our EEPROM. And if you look down, you can see LDAA, which in this case is 86. And the value that immediately follows 86 is, of course, 41, which, is, of course, is the data that we require for that particular operation. So it simply grabs that value that directly follows the instruction and puts that into accumulate array. Okay, so with immediate instructions, they, the data immediately follows the particular instruction or opcode in memory. So as I said before, with immediate addressing, it's always defined an assembler by the hash symbol. Okay, so if you leave the hash symbol out, it will assume some other addressing mechanism. So it's very important that you always put that hash symbol in there if you want to define it as immediate addressing. The 8-bit immediate values are in the range of 0 to 255, which is the range of an 8-bit value, or if they're signed, they're in the range of minus 128 to 127. If it's a 16-bit immediate value, then of course they're from 0 to 65,535, or they're signed, then it's you know minus 32768 to plus 32767, depending on what size of the operand that you're using. So size of the operand will actually be defined by the sort of instruction that you're doing. So if you're doing instruction that maybe is related to accumulator A or accumulator B, then of course the op operands will always be 8-bit. If you're dealing, however, with a, um, instruction related to accumulator D or index register X or Y or stack point or the program counter, then of course they're 16-bit registers, so therefore their operands will also be 16-bit in size when it comes to immediate addressing. Okay, so the next addressing mode is direct. Okay, when, when it comes to using immediate addressing, they're always useful if you know what the value is at, at compile time. So if you know what the value is beforehand, then you can always use immediate addressing and simply load a particular value in. Okay, but if you don't know that value, then of course that value will have to be stored in RAM, you'll have to read it from somewhere, you'll have to do some manipulation of that value, you'll have to store it somewhere into a memory location and then extract it out of that memory location into the processor to be able to do something else with it. So, so if you're going to use variables, then of course you're either using direct or extended or, or one of the indexed addressing modes. So direct is of course the first addressing mode where we start interacting with actual memory locations. Okay, so when it comes to using direct addressing, it basically direct addressing only has the use of one byte for its operand. So therefore it is only capable of addressing memory locations between zero and FF. Okay, so it only uses a single byte to hold that particular memory location where we want to extract our particular value from out of memory. So using a direct addressing mode, you can only generally see the lower 255 bytes of our memory map. And of course the lower 255 bytes of our memory map is where, is where all our I.O. subsystems live. So whenever you're reading anything from input-output devices, generally your assembler will be using a direct addressing mode. So to use an example of direct addressing, an example here, I've got LDA 55. So the value of 55, we go to the memory location of 55, okay? and we then grab the value that's at that memory location and we put that into accumulator A. So we use the, the, the memory reference, that the operator is effectively the memory reference to where in memory we should go to get the value that we require. So we go, so it's value 50, memory location 55, we go to memory location 55, we grab the value at that memory location and we put that value in accumulator A. Okay, so that's what happens with a direct addressing. When it comes to extended addressing, well, effectively with the direct addressing, we can only see the lower 255 bytes. Okay, so of course we've got a lot larger memory space than just 255 bytes. We've got all the way up to FFFF. So when it comes to seeing the other memory locations that are greater than 255, this is where we've got to start using extended addressing. Okay, so extended addressing uses a total of two bytes for its operands, so therefore it can see anywhere inside our 16-bit memory map that we have at our disposal. Because direct addressing uses only one byte, 
it actually operates a lot quicker. So it's always better to try and you can always remap those IO registers to another memory location. That way you can use the lower 255 bytes for a bit of RAM and have fast access using direct addressing. So with direct addressing, it's one less byte, and which means one less uh, memory fetch when, you, when you're trying to get that instruction in. So direct addressing effectively runs a lot quicker. But extended addressing has a white, la larger range of values we can grab from out of, out of our memory map. Okay, so therefore there's situations where we have no choice but to use extended addressing. So extended addressing allows us to see anywhere inside our entire memory space. Okay, but of course it runs a little bit slower, but we're only talking, you know, one instruction cycle slower. So when it comes to using extended addressing, it's the same way as direct, but we're just getting it out of, uh, a, I guess, a huger, larger variation of different memory locations. So in this example here, we've got an LDA1234. Okay, so... Effectively, we go to one, two, three, four. So we go to the memory location one, two, three, four, and we grab the value that's in that memory location, which in this case was B two, and we simply load that into accumulator array. So effectively, the operand on the extended in instruction is in fact a memory pointer to a particular location inside our memory map. So relative addressing is the next addressing mode that we used. Relative addressing is primarily used during instructions that are related to program flow. So changing the program flow. So say it's branching or jumping to subroutines and things like anywhere where we're sort of changing the program flow, this is the primary use of relative addressing. So all of our branch instructions all use relative addressing as well and our jumps and our branch to subroutines and things like that all use relative addressing. So this relative addressing operand consists of a single 8-bit number, okay, and this 8-bit number is a relative offset from the current value of the program counter. So in the case of our branching instructions where we use them to change the program counter, the relative value that we have on the end of that instruction is in fact a relative value in relation to the current value in the program counter. So a relative number can is obviously it's two it's a two's complement signed number and it can be anywhere between minus 127 and plus 127 so we can jump either minus 127 memory locations from the current program counter pointer value to 127 values so we've basically got a range of 127 values either side of the current program counter value so to give you an example of how relative addressing works in this example i've got a branch always command so it always branches irrelevant of what so it doesn't require any sort of conditions to take place. It just simply branches all the time. In this case, we've got a branch $FE. This is a two's complement number. And we all know that FE is, in fact, negative two. So therefore, the relative operand in this case is negative two. So therefore, the program, new program counter value would be the program counter is equal to the program counter plus negative two. So it simply takes two off the current program counter value, and that's what the program counter is set to. So if you look at... The picture down the bottom on the left hand side, we have the program counter pointing to F sorry to four zero F four. Okay? And then if we go and run the branch always FE command, then of course it takes two off it, which means the program counter now points to four zero F two, okay, which is back to the start of the branch always command. So therefore effectively this code is going to continually branch onto itself. Okay, so it's basically hit this instruction, it's simply going to loop continuously and go no further which is a very useful instruction to use and we'll talk about that a bit more, a bit more later on so that's how relative addressing works so it uses the current value of a particular register and assigns the new value relative to the operand value so it's always plus whatever the operand is so the operand can either be negative or positive it will simply offset the register by that particular amount Okay, so when it comes to indexed addressing, indexed addressing requires the use of an index register, hence the name of those registers. So index register X and Y, this is where they come into, in, into effect. So in order to use these registers, you effectively need to do some sort of calculation of that reg, um, index register to work out where we need to get our values out of memory. So it's very easy to see when we're using indexed addressing because it's always of the same sort of form where we have our mnemonic 
or our opcode, and then we have our operand, which is always an offset or some number of some kind, and then there's a comma, and then it's a particular register, whether it's X, Y, stack pointer, or program counter. Okay, so we simply have a value, comma, some register name. So that's how you can always tell when you're using index registering. You always have a number, comma, some letter. So the offset value in this case is a relative value depending on the current value of that register. So the first offset value is a relative with respect to the current register contents that you've got as the second portion of that operand. And using the, both the offset and the current register value, we need to calculate what the effective address is of where we can get the data or the operand for this particular instruction. So in this example here, I've got an LDA 3x. So we take the value in the x register. So we've got x. So we go to the x register. We grab the value out of the x register. And of course, it's moved to some temporary register somewhere in the, in the, in, in the um, microcontroller. We then take the va offset value of 3. And we add that offset value to the index register, which gives us our effective address. So therefore, we simply go to that address and we grab the value out of that address and we put that into accumulator array. So it's a bit of a roundabout sort of process of getting that value. So we go to the index register, we get the value out of that, we simply add, add the offset to it, that total value that we get for that resulting summation, we then go to that memory location, we get the value out of that memory location, we stick it into our accumulator. So it's a bit of a roundabout way, but this mechanism is absolutely perfect for doing for loops and iterative sort of um, assembly steps. So it's a great little mechanism of doing um, repetitive um, operations on memory. So hopefully now you've got a good idea on how to write assembly programs, the structure of the assembly um, program, and you've also got a good idea of the various operand restrictions and how the various addressing modes um, work. So if you should require any further assistance, do not hesitate to ask your demonstrator. Post the question on the forum email the convener, me, or make an appointment to come and see me. But either way, please make sure that you get all your questions answered.